So Greg took um, time out of his busy schedule to fly here just for this tonight. So we're super grateful for you coming up and making time. You're welcome. So Greg, tell us about your childhood. Did your childhood create an entrepreneur, or did it create the habits of entrepreneurship within you? I don't know about the second part of your question, but I think I had a pretty good childhood. It was kind of an Andy Mayberry kind of childhood. I spent most of my years in California. I was born in Boston while my dad was attending Harvard. He moved the family back to California, and he took a job with Hewlett Packard as one of their VPs of finance. Um, when I was about three years old, he moved the family to Geneva, Switzerland, where we lived for three or four years, and uh, then back to California. I moved to Utah when I was in high school. My parents were really attentive. I had five brothers and sisters, so kind of a classic, big family, California upbringing. And I don't know how that contributed to entrepreneurship um, or detracted from it, I, but I had a good childhood, a good family. What about your habits? About, I mean, did you ever have to go out and sell anything? Was that always part of who you were? Or was that all something, were those all attributes you developed after your childhood growing up? My childhood, I used to like to ride my mini bike in the orchards near the house. And there wasn't much selling or entrepreneurship. My dad believed in hard work. He grew up on a farm, so I always had uh, chores. Um, I had the classic jobs. Um, as a young man, I had a paper route and got up early in the morning and went and cleaned a Taco Bell um, for my first actual paycheck. Um, so my parents believed in, in, uh, in hard work, um, but I don't have a history of selling as a young person other than collecting money for the paper out. Awesome. So it doesn't matter where you come from, there's always a route to entrepreneurship, if that's what you want. Um, so tell us a little bit more about your undergraduate time. When, when did you really, I guess, become an, an entrepreneur? Um, I think there was a bit of a, a moment when I was in my undergraduate program, or when I started catching this vision. Um, I served a mission for the LDS Church in uh, Montreal, Canada. And while I was there, um, one of the young men that I worked with was in the computer science program at uh, University of Illinois. And we spent most of our days talking about computers and computer science and artificial intelligence. And I had left on my mission as a matriculated mechanical engineering student at the Utah University of Utah. And when I came home, I was all about computer science. And at the time, computer science was a bit of a black box industry. Um, it was still moving very quickly and very nascent. And most people who were associated with computer science felt like they were going to be creating something. And maybe that's a different mentality than you would have if you were studying to be a doctor, an accountant, or an attorney. Uh, that, that little creative juice, that pride of authorship of building a product or a program um, isn't always there in every discipline. But I think that's where the seeds of entrepreneurship were planted for me while I was in undergraduate school. So moving on to your undergraduate degree, what were some of your first business skills? Um, the first things that I did that were of an entrepreneurial nature were kind of interesting and came out of the blue. I graduated from computer science school and I was working for a mining company. Um, I was doing their code coding and RPG on an IBM System 34 back in the day. And, um, and my father-in-law called me. Uh, he was then serving a mission as well. And he had put a deal together around a company called Curbmate. And it was a company that imported um, a machine to extrude cement curb around your planters in your yard. And they were one of the first um, to create a business model around that. And so he pulled together the entrepreneurs and business managers and money, put this deal together, and then left on a mission to Hartford, Connecticut. And the deal was kind of going south. And he called me while I was in school and said, would you take a look at the business and see if using the skills you're learning in business school I was in early in my graduate program to uh, help write the ship, get the business back on track. So I went through that process, um, swapped out some of the management, got the business reorganized, got it to break even, um, and really sort of cut my teeth with the empowerment of this investor to solve some business problems. And um, it was that investor who, after I'd fixed that first business, uh, he was, a, he was a German national, so he was kind of speaking broken English, and we were meeting down at the Little America, and I'd given him this report of, of the things that I'd changed and that the business was now stable, but I, 
the phrase I remember saying kind of in passing was, if you want to have a business of the size and scale that you were sort of promised as an investor, you'd have to buy something else because this business doesn't have that potential, but it is building value and it's not losing money. And he said to me, how would I find such a business to buy? And I told him about business brokers, that businesses are listed for sale, that you can network your way to them. And he asked me if I would do that for him. I was 26 and I said, of course I would. I was in the habit of saying yes to most things. And that took me down a journey that lasted a year and a half. And ultimately he and I worked together to um, do a buyout of a company in Southern California called Chem Lab Supplies. And I moved my family down there to run it. So that transition from working as a favor uh, for an uncompensated summer to help fix the business of a friend, 24 months later, I was the CEO of a small business in Southern California that he and I had acquired together. And it changed the course of the rest of my life from something that would be much closer to programming to something that was much closer to entrepreneurship. Do you think that that change from doing technical work, being a programmer, to managing human capital, managing people, um, and flipping businesses, was that, was that natural for you? Was that something you realized you just had a tendency to? Or is that, was there a lot of growth associated with that? that I guess, was it like an awkward growing phase for you? Yeah, I felt like I'd been thrown into the deep end of the pool and had limited swimming skills. It was, um, they were trying times. They were difficult moments. Um, but I remember that I felt like I'd learned something from my years as a computer scientist that um, helped me a little bit. I, computer science is one of those things where if you're deeply involved in it and coding and you write a program and you expect a certain outcome and something else happens, you just don't tend to blame other people or blame the machine. You always have that feeling like, okay, there's something wrong with the code that I wrote and now I need to spend the time to go uncover the mistake that I've made and fix it. And a lot of people will go all the way through their school and never learn that sense of taking responsibility for mistakes and failure and the sense of determination that it takes to go debug several thousand lines of code and find the problem that you made and fix it and just own it in long hours in the wee hours of the morning when you're tired but you just don't blame other people and as I transition more into entrepreneurship I found that to be very helpful that mindset of when something's not going well you start with I caused this I can fix it I just need to put the time and effort into it to uncover where I've made a misstep and right that wrong and then the the whole will come back together and operate like it should so I'm always grateful to my computer science, not because I'm an amazing coder today, but I learned how to think and learned how to take responsibility for my work in a way that um, has served me really well. So you went from um, this chem lab company to a couple other ventures. Did you have any that were failures or that you ended up having to um, shutter before they really reached their full potential? Yeah. Let me start by answering the question why I would do more than one thing at a time. Um, That's a great question. Cause, I love this question. Because <laughs> it, it, uh, it paints the picture for the rest of it. When I was um, in my teens, I worked for my uncle building fences around the apartment buildings that he was building. He was building them all over Utah. He was naming them after his grandkids. He was building these apartments that typically would have 30 to 100 units and instead of selling them like a developer typically would, he would sell them, he would build them, finance them, lease them up and just let them pay him cash. He didn't sell any of them. He'd never sold an apartment. Um, and I was building fences around all of them, these grape steak fences. And uh, so I was watching this unfold and when I got into this um, leadership of Chem Lab, I thought, I wonder if I could treat businesses like apartment complexes like Uncle Don does, build them up, get them properly financed, get them properly staffed, and let them just run. And um, then I would live off the cash flow. I wouldn't necessarily be there like Uncle Don isn't there tending to these apartments. They're just assets that produce value. So I got this mindset that I could sort of Johnny Appleseed this entrepreneurship thing 
and I should be thinking about starting as many businesses as I could um, and have multiple businesses that were stable and producing cash flow. So I kind of started that process, always kept my mind open to the next idea, to the next conversation, to the next partner, to the next project. Um, at one point, um, I was 31 years old and I sold ChemLab Supplies, the first business that I'd started. And my proceeds from that was, a, if I remember right, it was maybe $7 million. But rather than a lump sum payment, I was being paid $50,000 a month or something like that, $75,000 a month. Um, for a long period of time and so it wasn't enough money that you'd feel like well I'm gonna buy a sports car and a, develop a crack habit and go off the rails <laughs> <laughs> but my thought was I now am completely free to do what I want with my days I can spend my time any way I want and I should be as productive as I can in that unique moment of not having to worry about where the next uh, meal is coming from so I started a business about every three to five months. It would take me that long to find an idea, find a couple of people to work with, um, test some of the assumptions and get something launched. I became really good at it. Um, I launched several, I bought a couple. Um, and over the course of the period of time between 28 years old and 40 years old, I started or acquired 18 businesses. And now coming back to your question, about a third of them were successful in my book, which is I sold it where my share was worth a million or more. About a third of them went kind of sideways, where over some period of months or a couple of years, um, there was a threat to this business model and it wasn't worth the energy to try to pivot it and I would close it, sell it, give it away, get it off my books in some way, uh, but kind of a sideways sale. And about a third of them were relatively spectacular failures from which I learned a great deal. Um, but the, the winners had more money and momentum than the losers by virtue of how you feed them. So net net it worked really well and that brought me forward to when I founded vSpring Capital. So my private entrepreneurship was sort of 26 to 40, 18 deals deep, all sorts of industries, companies in New York, Minnesota, Southern California, Utah, High tech, low tech, food, computers. There was no limit to or boundary to what I would take on if it looked like it um, could be profitable and, and that I'd be working with fun people. So you've had a ton of founders, a ton of partners in these ventures. Do you think that this idea, this mentality of stacking different businesses would work if you were trying to do it as a solo entrepreneur? Um, I'm not sure. I think it would work to a head count of three or four businesses. Um, I believe pretty strongly in this notion of sort of, uh, call it parallel entrepreneurship. And um, from an investor's pers perspective, it's an extraordinarily bad idea. From an entrepreneur's ex perspective, it's a fantastic idea. If, uh, you know, if, if you interviewed a, a hundred in investment professionals and ask them how you should um, invest your nest egg, you wouldn't find one that would tell you to take all of your wealth and invest it in one stock. It, the concept of diversification is the most unassailed premise of business that you'll find. It's just an unchallenged notion that that leads you to better risk adjusted returns if you're diversified. It's just entrepreneurship where you would find a venture capitalist or an investor that says, I want to see you 100% invested and dedicated. I'd like to see a mortgage on your home. I'd like to see all your wealth and your assets. I'd like to see 75 hours a week. I'd like to see you 100% passionately dedicated to the one idea that I'm investing in. But from your chair, from the entrepreneur's chair, if you're my brother and we're talking over Thanksgiving dinner and you say, how should I attack entrepreneurship? I'm going to say, you should do three things at once. And by doing so and load balancing and prioritizing those three carefully, you'd be able to find yourself doing high value activities for a higher proportion of your day because while one is dormant and doesn't need attention, another needs a lot and you're able to triage that. So your time is more valuable and you're hedging your own investment 
and you're creating diversification in your portfolio, you don't care which of the three goes over the long fence. You just need one long fly ball to clear the fence. And the premise is different if you only do one. If you only do one, there are parts of the day when there's nothing really important to be done, so you're in idle. Your scarce resource is your time, and you're wasting it because that particular deal doesn't have something intensely need of it, in need of attention. So like brother to brother Thanksgiving dinner, my advice would be diversify, the same as every other type of investment that you'd ever engage in. I put my VC hat back on and I say, 60 hours a week and a mortgage and everything you've got never will have should be poured into one business. So your entrepreneurship, the way you think about it and the way you stack your time and your ideas, the way you hedge your activity, the way you build for soft landings in case of failure, the way you fail fast, the way you marshal resources and manage them frugally, all will lead to your success. And I think, I'm, I'm going on too long. No, you're fine. I think you should think of yourselves as artists. Like, the business you're working on right now is the business you're working on right now. It is not your life's work. You don't need to tattoo the name of the company you're working on today on your forehead and forever be known as the guy who did that company or the gal who did that company. The world moves too fast. The luxury of doing one thing through your whole career is gone. That was the world our fathers lived in. The world you live in, if you're doing the same thing seven years from now, if we could all get back together and ask ourselves, are you doing the exact same thing you were doing seven years ago? Are we going to find one or two in the room that are? Because everyone else will be reinventing themselves and onto the new project or the new pivot or the new deal. So if you have that mindset like, I'm an artist and I have a sculpture in front of me that I'm working on and I'm part way through and one day I'll be done and then I'll start another. And you think of yourself as recursively engaging in entrepreneurship and refreshing yourself and your skill sets and your learning by going into new markets with new products and new ways you'll be happier, your journey will be more enriching, you'll be less clutchy about your current deal, you'll, you'll be less intense about money and equity and things because you'll have this sort of short-term view. Well, I'll try this decision this way and when I start my next company, I'll try it the other way. I can't play both hands today, so I'll play this hand, but I won't worry about it that much. Just see what happens and we'll learn from it and, uh, and we'll maybe do it differently next time. So you just, you'd find yourself relaxing into your entrepreneurship a little bit in a way that will bring some more joy back into it. So 18 companies, you, you talked a little bit about how you would, how you had to have partners. How did you pick your partners? I'm sure you've had a multitude of them, Maybe two or three for each of those companies? Yeah, and you know, humans are unpredictable. <laughs> and, uh, me included, I'm probably not a great partner. I'm not sure if a lot of you are great in partners or great employees as I'm looking around the room. Uh, How many of you are entrepreneurs by raising hands? Yeah. How many of you are actively looking for a partner right now for your business? Okay. You guys are probably chicken. I think the reason why people go to partnerships more than anything else is a lack of courage. More than anything else in my experience. And I would be thoughtful about that and spend more time thinking about the breakup clause and the prenuptial and the divorce okay. provisions <laughs> at the outset. <laughs> because uh, it is true that uh, sometimes partnerships last forever and they're perfect. It's, a, it's more common that they don't. Um, I've had people uh, that have worked very closely with me that have been through divorces and illnesses. I've been through an illness. Somebody goes offline for 10 months in a row or something, and what do you do if you have not allowed for that in your conversations? You're just, it's, uh, it's debilitating for the business. A business needs a leader, I think. It needs a, a relatively singular voice to rally around. Um, and so I tend to think, as you put partnerships together, um, if you have somebody and you call them a partner, that's great, but figure out a way how that you can either, you know, divide the business or carve some pieces out or um, dissolve your partnership without having to fracture a friendship. 
And if you do that forward thinking, um, I think generally when you look back on it, partnerships uh, deliver less and cost more than you imagine at the outset. So how do you build a company to sell it fast? Because you only get three eighteen companies if you're building to sell. Yeah, I think um, there is a mindset to it, and it, it um, probably revolves around being frugal more than anything else. It's easy for entrepreneurs to wrap their um, personalities and their egos up in the business, and they tend to spend more than they should, and they don't really develop a growth line and a, and a profitability line that will lead itself to a harvest. Uh, these entrepreneurial businesses are bought, they're not sold. Your job is to create something that's so compelling that somebody will come and beat your door down to take it away from you. Not something that you can build to a point where you think you can squeak it by if a banker puts enough lipstick on it that you can go find somebody that will take it before they discover the real truth about your business. What you're really trying to do is build something really compelling, relatively early, where there's enough uh, bright future, three or four different ways the business can grow and win, and if you sell it at that point, the buyer will pay the most because the growth numbers are compelling, the profit numbers are compelling, and, and there's enough future questions left unanswered that they can sort of imagine their own bright future about the business, and that's what causes them to pay the most. So you'd be very frugal. Every dollar that you spent, that you paid somebody or paid yourself, you'd think of, well, that's gonna cost me $12 in the sale if I can get a really high multiple and you use that mindset to make those decisions and you try to build a business with a very smooth, predictable lines of growth. And when you think it's approaching its potential, that's the time that you would try to market it and get into some conversation with somebody that might be interested in your business. So keep your emotion out of it, keep your ego out of it, stay very frugal, and manage the trajectories of your top line and your bottom line. So diametrically different than the way a lot of companies I feel like are run in Silicon Valley um, run on ego, run on focus, this thing's gonna work or die, and pouring everything you have, you know, 100 hour work week into it. People glamorize you know, uh, Elon Musk for maintaining his incredible working schedule. Uh, but how do you, through all of this, whether you're focusing in on just one, one future goal or whether you are stacking up multiple businesses, how do you manage the rest of your life um, to maintain balance and preserve those relationships with your family and your, the people you love? I heard two questions in there. The first is, um, I think it's important for us in the room, we're sort of the rank and file entrepreneurs. We're not the celebrity entrepreneurs. And if we can really understand where we fit into the ecosystem and what our opportunity set is realistically, we can create more for our families and be happier than if we compare ourselves to Elon Musk or Josh James or Pluralsight or Inside Sales or, you know, choose your um, entrepreneur in your company that you would uh, maybe pattern your aspirations after. But here's the thing that's interesting for me. Um, a few years back I started reading the Inc. 500 list and I'd read it as um, fertile ground for entrepreneurial ideas. And um, the last time I sort of looked at the averages, the average uh, company was uh, doing about 10 million in uh, revenue and profitable, uh, growing at 30 to 35 percent, and the majority were not venture-backed, and the founders were not Ivy Leaguers, uh, the majority did not have MBAs. Um, they were people who had recognized something about a customer need and built a business around it. And when I thought carefully about um, what I was seeing in the mix of businesses, they were recycling businesses and you know, business services and there was a variety of businesses. They weren't all like Twitter and Facebook. They were just regular businesses that needed to exist to serve customers. And so I think the degree of difficulty is lower, but the reward is really interesting. You know, if all of you could sort of trade what you're doing right now for a business with 10 million in revenue and 30% growth and you owned it maybe 80% because you've never raised money, you know, is that a trade you'd make? Probably. It's super interesting. So if you kind of let yourself fall into the trap of, you know, what is a venture-backed, you know, MBA, Ivy League, um, 
you know, Kleiner Perkins company look like and is that my aspiration where I think a thought that's never been thought before, imagine a product around it, build a deck, go to Sand Hill Road, raise $30 million, live under that stress for a decade, or do I find a customer that has a need, build a business around that, follow patterns of people around me or around the country that have done similar businesses, not something that's so unique or a product that needs a patent, but just solve a problem for somebody and build a 10, 20, 30 million dollar business over the next 10 years. It's a pretty good way to go. It's not a job, it's entrepreneurship, straight up. It's just more blue collar, hard work, sweat equity, um, persistence, persuasion, entrepreneurship. It's not cold fusion, Twitter, Facebook, entrepreneurship. And there's a difference. And the degree of difficulty goes down, the probability of success goes up, the stability goes up, the rewards are ample, plenty. You know, you don't need a billion dollars. 10 million is a really great number. A billion is, wouldn't change your life that much from 10 million to a billion. You drive a faster car and fly a bigger plane, but it's, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna dramatically change kind of how you think about money and your family. So, um, I just plant some of those seeds in your head instead of saying, you know, I need to think about the, you know, 60 IPOs this year that are venture backed. Think about the million businesses that will be started in 2017 by entrepreneurs all across the country and what those probabilities are and how well prepared you are to succeed at that. The second question was about how to balance your family. Um, I know there is a lot of family wreckage near the top of the entrepreneurial pile. Um, a lot of successful CEOs and entrepreneurs have not managed to keep their families together or in balance or um, really tended to, like maybe would be optimal. I feel like uh, I've worked really hard for 30 years, but I don't think I've missed a lot of games. I don't think I've missed a lot of vacations. Um, and it's just a matter of figuring out what it is that you're going to lift out of your life to be able to give the extra 10 hours a week to entrepreneurship and you don't have to lift out the softball games. You don't have to lift out the football games. What I lifted out was lawn mowing and car washing and bill paying and grocery shopping and buying my own clothes and all the rest of the stuff that's just the clutter that fills up the day of a dad and just don't give up on the stuff where you can spend time with your kids or go camping or go to a, you know, a family reunion or kind of be the places where you know you should be for your family and do the things that you know you should do for your family. It's a trade you don't have to make. It's a false choice. You can be entrepreneur 60 hours a week and keep everything together on the home front by lifting out all the clutter, using admins and automation to get rid of the things that most dads do that actually don't have much value. That's a short, that's a longer conversation we could have someday, but it's doable. So where can we go have that longer conversation? Is that, <laughs> is that the kind of the conversation you have at Junto? It is, it's interesting to look around the room. I see some Junto faces from various years and um, Junto. Uh, what is Junto? When I think about entrepreneurship, I'm like a guy who went on vacation to a fantastic place and wants to come back and tell people about it. Like I, ha I had an experience that now I want to share. Like that feeling you have like when you read a book or you listen to a song and your first thought is the people that I care about, I want to send them a note and say, I, I just went on this journey and it was amazing. So I feel that way about entrepreneurship. I feel like my life has been enriched enabled, empowered, I've been educated, um, I've met fantastic people, I've learned amazing things, all at the feet of entrepreneurship, capital E entrepreneurship. And so now I want to share it. And the, the thought kind of peaked a few years back um, when I was trying to figure out how to get people in a room together that had a similar passion for entrepreneurship and how I can encourage them to see it for um, the simple truth that it is, very doable approach to life, and encourage them to take that leap. So I wrote an email to all of the professors that were teaching entrepreneurship in the state at that time. This is 
I don't know, Ryan 15 years ago? Where did, where did Ryan go 15 years ago? And um, I said, I want you to introduce me to your B students that are in your classes that are so passionate and determined, but aren't necessarily um, amazing intellectual geniuses. It's not coming easy to them. They're being successful in your class because they're determined, because they're committed, and because they're passionate. So I got back all these email addresses, and I emailed all these students, and I said, hey, this is who I am, and this is what my journey has been. If you're interested in entrepreneurship, come over to my house on Saturday morning, and we'll talk about entrepreneurship. So all these people came to my house, none of whom I'd ever met before, and there was probably 25 of them. And so we started talking, just like we are, about entrepreneurship. And um, ultimately, I took them all down to Joanna's kitchen. We had pancakes, came back to the house. And I shared with them a thought that came to mind real time as we were talking. And I said, matter of fact, it was, the group was not much smaller than this, maybe two-thirds of this. I said, look, meet me every week for one night a week for eight weeks. And I'll share with you everything I know about entrepreneurship. We'll go one topic at a time. Ideation, finance, partners, customers, growth, hacking. And, um, and uh, at the end, I'll choose five out of this room and I'll fund your businesses. I'll put up the startup capital and we'll start something together. And I think about half the people in the room thought it was the most amazing thing that they'd ever heard. Some percentage of them thought I was probably signing them up for some multi-level strategy <laughs> that's <laughs> still hidden. And a couple of the guys in the room were MBA students who we got into a bit of an argument and I excused them from the group because they had just been brainwashed by their MBA experience. They just couldn't wrap their minds around this. And um, so we started meeting and uh, we met at Willow, Ke Willow Creek Country Club, I think. And so I'd serve them dinner and I'd tell them about entrepreneurship and every night I'd send them out on a challenge to do something really hard. Not because I cared at all, I didn't care at all. I just wanted to help them find out what they were made of. And if they had the courage, the bias to action, the commitment to go do hard things, because entrepreneurship has some hard moments. And uh, every night when I got the reports on what they had done the prior week, I found myself more and more encouraged that there is a body of a group of people out there. It's hard for them to find each other. It's hard for them to connect. That's why something like Startup Grind is so useful or Junto. Because without raising a, a flag and saying, gather here if you're interested in this, um, it's hard for them to find themselves on their separate campuses sort of all around the state having these feelings or this energy to do something entrepreneurial and not knowing how to deploy or encourage each other. So a couple of stories. Um, uh, one night we were talking about fundraising and I said to this Junto class, um, by then, by the time we got going, it was about 25, I think. And I said, um, I want you to go out and raise money from somebody that uh, you've never met before. You can't be related to them. You can't talk about a business plan. You can't use my name. You can't talk about Junto. And I I took all the easy stuff away, and there was a lot of whining about it. Well, wouldn't it be easier if we, and I'm like, yeah, it would be easier. That's why we're doing it this hard way. How much money? $5,000, and I said I wanted evidence in writing. <laughs> and so off they went, and um, they came back a week later, and the way I would organize the reports is I'd give each person two minutes, because I said, if you can't say it in two minutes, uh, we don't have time for it. So I just cut a point and say, two minutes, tell me what you did. And the first three or four didn't do anything. Well, I was thinking about it and I was getting my slide deck together and I was setting up appointments. Like, okay, next. And we went around the first three or four and then we got to um, a kind of a shorter guy. He's maybe 5'4". I don't remember his name. He had kind of a Hispanic look to him. Uh, didn't look uh, the part of the kind of Utah college entrepreneur. Um, but when he started speaking, about his story, the rest of the room just went quiet. He said, you know, I tried to think about where the rich people are, who would be my partners. So I went to the neighborhood that had the largest homes and it had a gated fence, so I climbed over the fence <laughs> and I walked up to the biggest house and knocked on the door and a woman answered and I said, my name is so-and-so 
and uh, I'm an aspiring entrepreneur and I'm looking for a business partner who would uh, help provide capital um, while I launched this business uh, in exchange for a partnership. And he went on with his experience and he came back and he pulled out this piece of paper and uh, said, here's her, uh, here's her commitment. And sure enough, there's a piece of letterhead that says Nedra Roney. And underneath it, it's like, I agreed to be your partner for $5,000 and she signed it. Wow. And I said, do you, do you have any idea who Nedra Roney is? And he goes, no, she's my partner. <laughs> And um, I explained that she was one of the founding families of New Skin and perhaps one of the wealthiest women in the state. And so he said, well, my plan worked then. And, but the, the courage associated with that and the determination to me is breathtaking. Another guy says he was the next morning after Junta was in line at a Cafe Rio. There was a woman in front of him on the phone in her mid 40s. and. He waited for her to get off the phone, struck up a conversation in line. He showed me a Cafe Rio napkin with her commitment. So you kind of go around the room and you divide it into two thirds. The third that didn't try because they were paralyzed by fear. The third that tried kind of half-heartedly and the third that just showed you something that you just didn't imagine was in the mix. You never thought it would happen. And um, you know, Ryan, who's in our audience tonight, we had a, a selling exercise and I won't go through the detail, but uh, Ryan showed me something. We, we assigned the group to sell love sacks and Ryan outsold the whole company of love sack for a week. He moved more bags than uh, the company did out of their, um, their location down by the railroad station. So uh, in each one of these weeks, I became more and more convinced that um, those people are out there who have this kind of behavior pattern, this fearless, dogged determination to be successful by small incremental steps, not by heroics, but just by courageous small steps. And uh, one of the things I like about Startup Grind is I think this is one of those places where that flag gets waved and you all show up and I hear the noise from the networking and you're finding each other and getting connected and encouraging each other to you know, kick each other out of the nest and just go flap your wings and see what happens. And more people think and talk about entrepreneurship than actually do it. But it's, it's not as hard as you imagine. And once you sort of get in the swing of doing those courageous things on almost impulse, almost a little bit with a little bit of a reckless mindset, uh, you find that it comes more and more naturally and you find more and more success. I am just in the in full disclosure, I did go this last session and you know, even if you have experience being an entrepreneur, it's a great experience for you because you're always finding new ways. You know, he'll give you a challenge. Go, go find three new mentors. And when you go and do it, every time you're doing these activities, it's going to align with whatever it is that you're doing. And you know, I think it's really interesting, Greg, that you have what I feel is a unique perspective on entrepreneurship because I grew up you know, being told to either, you know, find a niche and grow a huge company and to pick something and, you know, to pick something that you venture back or to start a lifestyle brand and grow it and then stay in it. And, you know, what Greg has kind of shared with us tonight essentially is you just have that pattern of starting companies, starting companies, starting companies. And regardless of who you are, your level of intelligence, it's, it comes down to that courage and that, consist that consistently applied courage. And it's just so unique. So if you are interested, um, they're going to be hosts. They're going to have another session in spring next year. Yeah, I usually do it as folks are coming out of college and moving into the summer, hoping to catch a few uh, graduating seniors who are ready to get a little bit reckless through the summer. So if you're interested, um, you can just email me through Startup Grind, and I'll forward your information to them. Um, moving on from Punto, you know, What's the most important attribute for a founder to have? You know, my thinking about that has changed over the years. Um, at first, I thought it was some form of persistence, kind of in my 20s. My 30s, I thought it was some form of persuasion. I felt like you're always trying to persuade people to join the energy path that you're on. Come work for me when I can't afford to pay you. Buy from me when I'm not the smartest choice. Um, sell to me when I'm maybe a bit of a credit risk, join my board when I can't pay you. It just goes on and on. The, the moments of 
salesmanship and persuasion that an entrepreneur goes through. I think I've now come full circle where I feel like um, the most important ingredient that de-risks an entrepreneur's undertaking is how well he understands the market and the customer that would buy from him. Um, I remember uh, getting acquainted to Rick Alden, the founder of Skull Candy, and you know the examples of the times that I saw Rick um, call the market correctly um, were just breathtaking. He would say, you know, if we make a pair of headphones that looks like coconuts, we're going to sell them like crazy. And the board would be like, coconuts? What are we going to make? He'd be like, well, we'll make them out of wood, of course. And, you know, the, they seem like crazy ideas, and we would just sell more and more and more headphones, you know. If he um, imagined the colorways and the packaging, uh, he would sell it. He was the embodiment of the customer-consumer. And I realized that the rest of the skill sets that, um, you know, in some cases he wasn't uh, the best at, um, finance, accounting, forecasting, um, managing human capital, uh, were not his strengths. But the customer, understanding and predicting the customer, how much more will they buy if you drop the price five bucks? How much less will they buy if you raise it a buck? What happens if you paint it blue or red or green? Will you sell more or less? Or what if you bundle it, package it, sell it in Europe? He got all of that right. And the rest of it became easier when all of that was right, when you accurately assess demand. So one of the things I look for in entrepreneurs that we fund at Mercado is somebody who really understands the market and the customer very well and has a demonstrated ability to predict that. I think the persuasion and the determination are important, um, but I, I've I've weighted my thinking more towards um, understanding the market as one of the keys to success. It's a hard thing to do. It requires some study and some empathy, um, but it's worth the journey if you can get to the point where you can really understand the customer need. How many, how many founders do you think you've interviewed and selected in this process uh, throughout, throughout all the companies that you've either funded or launched yourself? Just give, these, just give everybody an idea of where your insights are being derived from? I've probably funded 150 companies in my life so far. Um, and I've judged a bunch of competitions as well, but I think when you're really going to write a check, there's a different kind of process yeah, that, that gets involved. So, yeah, might have, might have been involved in the selection of 150. Let's talk a little bit about some times that you felt like throwing in the towel. With, with that many opportunities, I mean, when, how did you know when to call it quits and on, on some of those earlier opportunities? And what made the difference between, you know, between the struggle and just making the decision, making those decisions that change the outcome um, to be successful? So there's been a couple of reasons why I've gotten out of a project, um, and they really fall under two categories. One is I think the business has become unviable, and secondly, the opportunity cost has become too high. So there are some situations where I feel like I'm putting a lot of time and energy into a business that probably will be marginally successful. It's not unprofitable, but probably um, I need to move on from it. And those have been some of the funnest meetings. I'll tell you one story. Um, there was a group of engineers at Northwest Pipeline that were being let go, so I hired them all and rolled them into a company called Sattel Corporation. And, and I funded them and ran it for three or four years. And it looked like it was going to stay more of a consultancy rather than a product company. And so that's about when I was thinking um, that I'd like to get out. And there were, of these seven um, engineers, one of them had sort of emerged as being the trustworthy, truth-telling, give me the bad news in an unvarnished way. And there were several others who were kind of a what's in it for me kind of a mentality. And so I gathered them all together one day for a meeting and I signed over all of my equity to Wilden Pearson, the guy who had just, they were all equal, right, in terms of their ownership before that. But he was the guy who had been fair, had been thoughtful, had thought about my interest in position, tried to look out for me. And so for me to take all my equity, which was more than half, and just slide it across the table to Wilden Pearson and say, it's yours in front of everybody else and just be like, for free. <laughs> and so um, he built that business into um, an IT temp for hire kind of a business. And 
Uh, within a couple of years, there were 50 or 60 consultants, and he was pulling an override over all of their activity. And it turned out to be great. It's just that I was looking for a product company that could be sold, and that was a consultancy that needed a leader. And uh, so it was an example of a moment where I felt like um, Wilden will make more of this business than I will, and it'll be life changing for him, and it'll enable me to take that same amount of energy and focus and put it somewhere else. So there's been a lot of different ways for me to um, back up from businesses that were taking a lot of time on the opportunity cost side. Um, I don't know, you, you got to take your lumps, you take your winners and your losers as you go through life. You think of it as a multi-inning game and I don't worry so much about the deal I'm working on and how it's panning out. There'll be another, it'll be fine. I sort of feel like entrepreneurship is such a, it's almost a panacea in a way. Like I have a hammer and everything looks like a nail. When I'm, sitting, when I'm sitting with somebody who feels depressed and they feel like they're trapped in their job and they've got a lot of debt, I'm thinking, Dad, you should start a business. And somebody's, you know, I, I, it's almost any conversation I'm in where somebody is unhappy. I feel like entrepreneurship speak to, speaks to so many fundamental human needs. Like, like we all have this deep-seated desire to express ourselves and a business that you create is a canvas that you're painting on. You're building the culture, you're building the product, you're solving the problem, you're addressing what's important. And all of that is a form of self-expression. It's your art. It enables you to be more self-directed, more self-reliant. If you have a job, if you're my boss and we're having our annual review, I've got to go and convince you that I'm worthwhile and that I'm doing good work. If I'm an entrepreneur, I'm beholden to customers, sometimes investors. But it's a different kind of a thought process. I feel very free. I feel very mobile. I feel very empowered. Um, what it does for families, what it does for communities. Um, think about the things that you like to do. I, I like to race. Uh, what are the chances that our tax money would build Miller Motorsports Park or a concert series or a movie theater or your favorite restaurant? The chances are zero. All of those things come from entrepreneurship, so it enriches us as individual humans in a very personal way, a very empowering way. It enriches our families in terms of our self-reliance and our independence and our confidence and our sense of worth. It helps our communities. I mean, I'm grateful to you because my grandkids are going to grow up in a world where you're running the businesses, and that's better for me and for my grandkids, so thank you. And entrepreneurship is where the wealth is created and the, the, the fabric of new ideas. All the new products come from small entrepreneurial companies. The new technology comes from small entrepreneurial companies. Job creation, uh, economic development. That's why we have something like Silicon Slopes and why essentially every city in the nation is trying to copy Silicon Valley and every country in the world is trying to copy the US because our secret weapon as a nation is not our natural resources. We're not endowed with the best set of natural resources in the world. It's not our population. We don't have the most youthful, well-educated population. It's the creativity and entrepreneurship that causes most of the interesting stuff to come from America. If we lose that, it's to our fantastic loss. And if we leverage it, it's the secret to America's power. So measure it as a human, as a couple, as a family, as a community, as a nation. There is no metric that you can apply where entrepreneurship is not fantastic. So to the extent that you have the courage to participate, you live in the place and you have the education that lays that road in front of you, the only thing between you today and there is courage, a bias to act, an ability to be reckless, an ability to be sort of unemotional and not married to your ideas, but be, listen to the data, listen to the market, be responsive, be nimble. That's where the advantages come your way as an entrepreneur. Customize, serve your customers, respond to them, price for them, you'll win. There are thousands of businesses that you could choose models that you could follow, businesses that you could import from other locations, from other industries into things that you know and places that you live 
and win relatively easily. So I got a hammer and everything looks like a nail. You can do it. <laughs> you can do it. So Greg, what challenge would you like to leave us all with tonight? I think I'd just build on what I just said. I, I can't look into your eyes and read your minds, but my guess is, is that those of you who aspire to be entrepreneurs and are not yet entrepreneurs today, you know, examine yourself. It's probably gonna be 80% fear. When you say, well, if I just had a good idea, I would start, that's a cop out. The good ideas are all around us. Um, you may have a challenge of recognizing them, but you could train yourself through that. If you say, if I only had investor money, then I would start, that's a cop out. There is more money in the world today available for good ideas and entrepreneurs who have passion than ever before. And it takes more forms at lower cost than I've ever seen. There's angel money, there's uh, money available for you through credit, there's more funds like mine, there's billions and billions of dollars looking to be deployed in successful businesses. So um, that excuse doesn't work. So what does that leave you with? You know the money is hovering over here if you need it. The ideas are hovering over here if you need it. So why are you sitting here in your job or in your inactivity and not stepping into that space? It's probably courage. It's probably that you feel like you need to have a perfect plan in place before you take the first step. And really, it's a drunkard's walk. It's just a, it's a rambling journey. You don't know where you'll be a few years from now. You just know that if you try hard, if you're pleasant to work with, if you're smart, if you're, um, if you use common sense, that there's a place for you in this entrepreneurial world and it'll reward you amply. So, my short statement would be find a way to sweep the excuses aside and get started. Not for me or for anyone else, not for your spouse or your family, just for you, for what it'll do for you, for your mindset, for how you feel about yourself, for your creative expression, for the mark you leave on the world. Pick up that hammer. Hammer time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Greg, for taking time to meet with us tonight. Let's give a big round of applause.